Uh, well, first of all, let me start by thanking all of you who've organised this meeting. It's been really great, actually. Sometimes I sort of feel like we're just having too many conferences at the moment with online. They're great, but it's really getting ridiculous. It's like I'm spending all day in front of a screen. Um, but once again, I found this conference uh, really, really good, actually. And uh, so thanks so much for organising that. And um, uh, yeah, I decided at a very late time, actually just early this morning, to change the title of my talk um, and talk about something else, which I just thought might interest the community here. Um, it's actually a little problem which I came across a few years ago when I was writing a paper on uh, symmetry constraints in um, NMR. Um, and I just thought it would be worthwhile to bring that up again to the Zolf community because it's, you know, maybe relevant to some things. Um, and I think for those of you who don't know, not so familiar in how to handle symmetry of spin systems and so on, there may be a few things to think about here and, and learn how, uh, maybe learn from. Um, so let me try and explain what the problem is. Um, oh yeah, I just want to mention that a lot of these discussions, uh, these ideas were developed through discussions with Jean-Nicolas Dumez when I was visiting Paris. Um, right, so let's look at the four spin system, which one typically has in Sabre. And I think on the first day of the conference, Thomas Tice, who's done uh, a lot of the really seminal work in this area, uh, introduced this type of spin system. So I'm not going to say much more about it. The um, the idea here is that you have two protons which came from the power hydrogen and which may be bound to the catalyst. And then we have two ligands, maybe containing N15, for example. And there's a sort of network of J couplings which, which connects these systems. And what you want to do is um, is to convert the singlet polarization, which came in from the power hydrogen. So, for example, if you have 100% power hydrogen, you have complete singlet polarization of these two protons. And what you would like to do, and sometimes you can, is to convert this state of singlet polarization of the protons into complete Z polarization or magnetization of the uh, well, the S spins, which could be nitrogen 15s or carbon 13, or sometimes protons. Uh, and I want to look at this problem here in a, in a very abstract way. So I'm not going to talk about specific methods or techniques, but just very much in principle, what, what does the mathematics allow you to do and what does it not allow you to do? Um, I think, you know, just by itself, that's an interesting topic. Once you've established that something is possible, then you can start to think about how to actually do it. That's when your real problems start. But for now, I, I just want to, in this talk, I just want to address, address this problem in a very abstract way. What is in principle possible and what is not? Um, so how much polarization can you actually in principle transfer over? And in particular, how does that depend on the type of spin system that one is dealing with? In particular, these network, the network of J couplings. So if we're doing this in Zolf NMR, all we have is the J couplings. And the, the particular pattern of J couplings actually determines very strongly this, the answer to this question. Um, now, just to discuss that, I need to introduce uh, a minimum of mathematics, really. But I need some operators to describe the, the state of the system. Uh, so I'm going to use something called the I spin singlet order operator. Um, so that's what this abbreviation means here. So it's singlet polarization for the I spins. So that is the operator which describes this state. And the operator which describes Z polarization for the S spins. And that's this operator here. Now these factors here are non-intuitive and I'm not I'm not going to explain them exactly how these uh, factors are constructed. In fact, the, the construction of these operators is really quite an important part of work in hyperpolarized NMR, I think. Uh, and one which is can be very tricky. Um, uh, so I would say let, let, let's just live with these particular definitions. 
what these definitions have uh, uh, have um, uh, a convenient property of is that if the spin density operator, which describes the state of the of the spin ensemble, is expressed as a sum of this uh, single polarization operator multiplied by some factor and some z polarization operator multiplied by some factor plus other orthogonal operators the maximum single polarization operator you can have is one and the maximum maximum z polarization 100 percent polarization is one so these particular operators have the correct properties to allow you to say that if the density operator contains purely this operator uh, multiplied by a factor of one, then you have complete singular polarization and, and similarly for this operator. So these operators basically work in this context. So the problem I want to address then is if you have singular polarization for the I spins, and you apply some unitary transformation. So what that means is you you apply some coherent Hamiltonians or you allow the system to evolve coherently. So that can be a pulse sequence, sequence of magnetic fields. It doesn't include relaxation. Um, but if you just allow coherent evolution, how much in principle of the Z polarization can you get? Is it one? Can you completely transfer the singlet order to 100% uh, polarization of the S spins, or is it less than that? And the answer to that turns out to depend on the symmetry of the coupling network. And that's the problem which I want to talk about here. So I, actually, I just present the answer here, the answers to this, and then I want to just take you through some of the theory um, of how you get to these answers. Um, so if there's no symmetry in the J coupling, so all, all of the possible J couplings here, they're all different, um, which you know may occur in some complexes, then you can actually go all the way and convert the singlet order completely to 100% polarization. If, on the other hand, you have magnetic equivalence, so the spin system is of the type A2, X2, that happens, for example, if all of these couplings between the I spins and the S spins, they're all the same. So this coupling is the same as this coupling, is the same as this coupling, is the same as this coupling. Then these two spins are magnetically equivalent, and these two spins are also magnetically equivalent. In this case, you can't transfer any singlet order to Z polarization. So this would be a very bad situation to try to perform Sabre. Um, now, the actual problems which are dealt with in, in um, Thomas Tice's work, for example, and collaborators, uh, the spin system is the, uh, the suspends are not magnetically equivalent, they're magnetically inequivalent. And the spin system type is usually called A, A prime, X, X prime. So basically you have two couplings which are the same and two couplings which are different. And in this case, the answer is maybe a bit surprising. You can only transfer 50% of the power hydrogen polarization to S-spin polarization. Um, so in the particular types of complexes which are, uh, are used with spectacular results in um, uh, some of this Sabre work, when you're dealing with spin systems of this kind, um, uh, the fact is, is that you can never get more than 50% polarization on the two S-spins, say two N15s. So what I want to do is discuss why that is. And I don't have any solutions for this, except that we have to deal with a different type of spin system. But maybe just by exploring how this result comes about, there may be some things to learn and some solutions may arise. 
So it's all about symmetry. So what I'm going to talk about here is a little bit about how you develop a symmetry theory in spin dynamics. Um, so let's start with the A2X2 system. So the, these, in this case, you have two magnetically equivalent I spins and two magnetically equivalent S spins. And we write down the J coupling Hamiltonian. And it has terms for the II coupling, has terms for the SS coupling, and it has terms for the IS coupling. But the point is, is that all four couplings are the same. So you can multiply all of these four coupling operators by the same factor. Now, to treat symmetry, you use group theory. And uh, those of you who have a chemistry background will have learned about point groups, but actually, uh, which, de which determine molecular symmetry. Actually, what we need here is not, uh, not point groups. So the actual shape of the molecule is not relevant here. It's the uh, what's called a permutation symmetry. Um, which means which operations of swapping spins with each other leave the Hamiltonian invariant. And there's a notation for this, which may be unfamiliar to, to many of you or some of you. What this means is the bracket one, two means swap spins one and two. So actually, if you stare at this Hamiltonian for long enough, you can convince yourself that if you swap spins one and two, it doesn't change. So for example, I1S3 then becomes I2S3, but there's another term I2S3 here. And then this I2S3 changes to I1S3, which is the same as here. So in the end, you've changed nothing. So this permutation operation, swapping one and two, leaves the Hamiltonian invariant. The same for three, four. The same for if you swap one and two and swap three and four at the same time. That's what this means. So double swap. The Hamiltonian is also invariant. And if you do nothing at all, which is the empty bracket here, then of course the Hamiltonian is invariant. And in technical mathematics, this forms what's called a, technically a group. And that from that property of, it, of these objects forming a group, all sorts of mathematical properties flow. And we use some of those mathematical properties in the, in the theory. So the Hamiltonian commutes with all of these different permutation operations. And we say actually that the Hamiltonian HJ belongs to the symmetry group, which is defined here. So that's a way of saying, of defining what the symmetry properties of the Hamiltonian are in a very abstract way. If we have an A, A prime X, X prime system, on the other hand, where these two couplings are the same, but they're different from these two couplings, then the permutation group is different. So again, we have had different terms, but now we have two different types of heteronuclear couplings. And the symmetry group is actually smaller and only contains the double swap operation in which you swap one and two, and you also swap three and four. And it takes, you have to sort of examine this carefully to see that that's the case. So if you just swap one and two, then you don't leave the Hamiltonian invariant. But if you swap one and two and, and also swap three and four, then the Hamiltonian is invariant. So that's the symmetry group in this case. Now, from now we launch into the sort of mathematics of how to do this. Um, so let's start with the A2X2 system. We have the symmetry group of the, um, the J coupling Hamiltonian. We have four spins a half, so we have 16 spin states, and we can construct them as usual. Alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, and so on. 16 altogether. And we take those 16 states and we combine them in a special way to make what's called symmetry adapted spin states. And Thomas and others have already used these in, in the talks earlier in the conference. So this means symmetry adapted basis, and again, you have 16 states. One of them uh, is denoted singlet, singlet, singlet for states one, two, and singlet for spins three, four, sorry, spins one, two, and spins three, four. So we take the two singlet states for spins one and two and three and four, multiply them together, and we get this uh, state. 
So this is a special combination of the 16 Zeeman states. And those particular constructions um, have a special property, which is they're all of them eigenstates of all of these four operators. So an eigenstate means that if you apply an operator like this one, the three four swap operator to this state, you get the oper uh, you get the state back again multiplied by number, which in this case is minus one. So that's called an eigen equation. And you say that this state is an eigen state of the operator three four with eigenvalue minus one. So the symmetry adapted states have this property. They're all eigenstates of the permutation operators. And in fact, you can now sort out your 16 states into four different groups, which a bit surprisingly are not the same size. You have a group of nine states, you have one isolated state, you have a group of three states and another group of three states. They add together to 16. And those groups are defined by their eigenvalues. So for each of these groups of states, so this particular here has eigenvalues for all of the four permutation operators. In this case, all of the eigenvalues are plus one. This state, the single, single state, has eigenvalues plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. So these have different symmetry signatures, these groups of states, which are given by these eigenvalues. And in the technical language of this field, we call these irreducible representations of the permutation group or IREPS for short. And they have certain co conventional labels, which are G for even and U for odd. So we have nine states in the IREP GG, one state in the IREP UU, three states in the IREP GU, and another three states in the IREP UG. OK, so our 16 symmetry adapted states are now sorted into these four groups. And we can do the same thing if we have magnetic uh, inequivalence. Just in this case, the symmetry group just contains these two elements, the null element and the double swap. But again, it's the same story. Uh, we construct symmetry adapted states, which are eigenstates of these permutation operators. And again, you can organize the states into two groups. In fact, there's a group of 10 and a group of six. And the two groups have different um, eigenvalues for the two permutation elements of the permutation group. So we have 10 states which have eigenvalues plus one and plus one. They're called G states. And we have six states which have eigenvalues plus one and minus one, which are called the U states. So just to summarize so far, if you have an A2X2 Hamiltonian, which happens when you have magnetic equivalence, then you have these following IREPs, four IREPs, with nine, one, three, and three states. If you have magnetic inequivalence, the group has two elements, and you have two IREPs with 10 and six states. Now you see actually that this group here is what's called a subgroup of this group. So it's already the elements here are contained within this group, although this group has two extra elements. And in the mathematics of group theory, that means you can make a correspondence between these IREPs. And in fact, the G IREP of this group um, is composed of the GG and the UU IREP of this group and so on. So the nine and one states combine to make the 10 states here and so on. OK, so that's the geography of the spin states for symmetrical Hamiltonians in this case. What do we do with it now? So we return now to our problem. We want to convert different types of spin order into each other. So let's say, first of all, we don't have any symmetry. So we want to convert a particular operator A into an operator B. 
And we're asking the question, how much of the operator B can we get? So this factor B, what's its maximum value? And the, this problem was asked and answered actually back in the um, 1980s by Ulla Sorensen, very beautiful piece of work actually. And the, the answer to this problem is as follows. You take the eigenvalues of these two operators, you take the eigenvalues of A and put them in a vector, let's call it lambda A. And you sort them going from the least up to the the, the, the minimum value up to the maximum value in order, that's important. You do the same for B. And then the maximum value of this factor, which tells you how much polarization you can transfer from one order, one operator to another, is given by this construction. It's just the dot product between these two sets of eigenvalues divided by actually the um, this is the norm squared of the operator B. So if you just calculate that factor, you can do this for any operator A and B. And Ulla Sorensen and co-workers use this for treating many problems of polarization transfer in high field NMO. So we could do that, for example, for these two operators we're interested in, the singlet polarization operator for the I spins and the Z polarization operator for the S spins. And if you determine the eigenvalues, um, which I'm not doing here, but it's just using uh, spin dynamica, for example, you get a set of 16 eigenvalues for each of these operators and they look like this. So, and these are sorted. So going from the least one, which is minus one here to the highest one, which is three. So you actually have 12 minus ones and then four threes. And you take the dot product between those two vectors. And with a little working, you see that that's actually just one. So that means it's possible if you don't have any symmetry to convert singlet order from the I spins to 100% polarization on the S spins. And that's one of the things I started with. So it is possible to convert singlet order to 100% S-spin polarization in this type of spin system if the Hamiltonian, the J couplings, don't have any symmetry. But now we look what happens if they do have symmetry. And then the answer to this is modified. We bring in these irreps, which are often denoted gamma. And you see this formula is very similar to the one which occurred before, except we have the sum over the irreps. And the key thing here is that these are the eigenvalues of operator A, which belong to a particular irrep gamma. But once having allocated them to that irrep, you must then sort them, going from uh, smallest to largest, but within that irrep. And that has a big effect because that means you rearrange all of the different eigenvalues. So, for example, in our case of two operators here, we have 16 eigenvalues of the operator A. But if we sort them into, organize them into the four irreps appropriate for the permutation group of the A2X2 spin system, then the, the eigenvalues look like this. So the, there's one, um, uh, one vector of minus ones repeated nine times and so on. And similarly for operator B, we now get these vectors of eigenvalues. And we can now do this construction where we combine these eigenvalue vectors to determine the largest possible transfer you can have by summing the dot product of the eigenvalue vectors over the irreps. And for example, one of these terms, the UG term, if we just lift out the vectors from the previous slide, the um, A 
eigenvalues are just three, three, three repeated th three times. And the UG, uh, the B eigenvalues are minus one, zero, plus one. And the dot product of those two vectors is zero. And the same happens actually for all of the four IREPs. So the total transfer you can get is zero in this case. In other words, you can't transfer any order. So by symmetry, we can show that if the um, spins have this A2X2 coupling topology, so magnetic equivalence, you can't transfer any order from the singlet state of the protons to polarization on the S spins. And then we can do the same for the A, A prime, X, X prime case. In this case, we have two IREPs, G and U. And again, if we ex extract the eigenvalues, it now looks like this. So now we have nine minus ones and a single plus three divided by 16. And similarly for the U eigenvalues. And for the B eigenvalues, uh, we get also a vector of 10 elements and a vector of six elements. And again, we can combine these vectors to extract the maximum possible transfer by calculating this uh, factor here. There is transfer allowed now. For example, if we take the U IREPs and combine them in this way, we get a factor of one over 32. And if we go through the mathematics for, for both IREPs, we find a maximum transfer of a half. So in the case of magnetic inequivalence, the AMX X prime spin system, which is, is commonly a relevance in Sabre in Zulf conditions, then the maximum transfer from the para-hydrogen polarization to the S spin Z polarization is 50%. So you can't, by this, using this type of spin system, polarize the S spins to more than 50%. So that's, that's uh, independent of any sequence of magnetic fields or pulses or other things you can do, unless you can change the symmetry of the Hamiltonian which couples these spins. So just again to... Uh, just to repeat, if there's no symmetry, you can get 100% polarization. If there's magnetic equivalence, you can't get anything. And if there's magnetic inequivalence, and you have an A, A prime, X, X prime coupling spin system, then the symmetry theory says you can only get 50%. And that seems to be a little bit of a problem, which is worth addressing. Um, Um, so the general message here is that we should realize that when we do spin system manipulations in zero field, we're completely relying on the J coupling Hamiltonian and in many molecules that has a certain permutation symmetry. And that symmetry will constrain how you can, the polarization can uh, flow around in the spin system. Just because everything is coupled to everything else in zero field NMR doesn't mean that you can always drive one type of spin order into another type of spin order. Sometimes the symmetries get in the way. Uh, and in the case of Sabre, it seems like in a common situation that is actually the case. So the AA prime X, X prime spin system, which is exploited uh, in some of the Sabre experiments, and these are, you know, these are fantastic, um, fantastically beautiful experiments. Um, but there is a remaining problem, I would say, that that you can't get more than 50% polarization this way. And I don't have a solution to this problem. The solution will clearly um, requires one to use the system in which the J coupling um, topology does not have. Uh, that symmetry, but a lower symmetry or no symmetry at all, which will require it slightly different chemical structures. Um, and even if you have that spin system, uh, you still then have the task of designing an actual manipulation which achieves, in principle, 100% polarization. 
Um, but you will do that in the knowledge that at least theoretically it's possible. Um, beyond that, I don't know how to solve this problem. So it's a problem and a challenge for us, I think, uh, if we would like to attain higher than 50% polarization through this type of uh, uh, polarization transfer. And just before I f well, closing, I'd just like to thank again the, the initiators of the Zolf network, um, Dima and Shimon, I think were instrumental and thank you very much uh, for bringing me into this. It's extremely exciting and instructive. Um, the conference organizers here, who I probably missed some names out, but thank you anyway. Um, and the members of my group who are working with power hydrogen. So Laurinas has given the poster, which uh, as uh, Stefan said, you're encouraged to look at. Uh, I'm lucky to have in the group at the moment, Sumia Singer Roy, who worked with Simon Duckett on Sabre. Um, uh, in particular, a polarizing pyruvate with Sabre. So that's something we want to get back to. Uh, and Johannes Kollel, who came from Thomas Tice's group, but has now left our group, but got us started actually with some of the parahydrogen work, um, which actually uh, should, I should thank Stefan actually, because Stefan, when he was spent time, some time in our group, he, he started us off with parahydrogen actually. And thank you very much, Stefan, for that. Um, uh, so Stefan, Jean-Nicolas, and the visitors we've had through the Zolf, um, um, uh, network who have been really nice to have. Oksana, who got sadly got stuck in Southampton for about six months due to lockdown, and Shema. Um, so thank you, and I'll be very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, very, very enlightening talk. Um, I actually uh, have a question um, myself. Uh, so uh, my friends recently um, develop a uh, code uh, which an, uh, allows to determine all uh, irredu irreducible presentations and all uh, the all the reps of uh, any Hamiltonian uh, uh, of a spin system. Do you know, uh, so it seems that it probably would be interesting to just to have a uh, arbitrary spin system and then to uh, write down automatically all the reps of it. Do you know, uh, is there other um, realizations, known realizations probably in uh, spin dynamic or is, uh, in spinach? Well, so, uh, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, Christian Banks actually, who I should have thanked here. Um, um, he's written code for constructing symmetry adapted bases for any permutation group. Uh, but what you're saying is something a bit different than if you have a Hamiltonian determining what the permutation group is. Yeah. Um, no, we don't have, a, I don't think we have a, like a, a sort of single line coding for that. Um, um, yeah, it, it sounds very useful, uh, but I agree. It, it is actually, um, it would be very good actually to have uh, code which lets one handle this rather technical mathematics um, in a very convenient way. And yeah, we, we do this in Spin Dynamica, but we don't have uh, ready-made packages for that, except uh, Christian's um, coding on um, constructing symmetry adapted bases. Yeah, I see. There's also a very interesting topic actually, which is, is, I find quite mind blowing that this, all this permutation symmetry entangles in a very amazing way with the angular momentum theory through something which is known as has a, a weird name of sure veil duality so basically when you make a permutation group of spins then these irreps automatically acquire angular momentum quantum numbers which you can also predict um, so we all know this in a for small systems like we know that the single state is anti-symmetric with respect to exchange and has spin zero and the triplet state is symmetric with respect to exchange and has spin one 
But why is that? Why do the angular momentum and the permutation properties go together? And they always go together. And there's a very, very deep theory of that, actually, which uh, Christian Banks actually has a, a paper himself on. Yeah. 